Hi, you know what I was thinking about recently? I mean, you're here, you've read the video title, so you have at least a general idea. So, I was thinking about games that should be made into movies or TV series. Which ones of them would make for an entertaining and non-interactive viewing experience? And you know what? There's so many. I mean, I could talk about them for hours, but I think it's best that we start with just a few today. UFO Enemy Unknown is a turn-based ground strategy tactical combat game with some superficial role-playing elements. Namely, it allowed you to name your soldiers and then witness them progress, get better and eradicate the aliens come one grey or green corpse at a time. It also means that you saw them perish at the hands or plasma weapons burns of same aliens, but such is the cost of war, I suppose. The game is set in not too distant, but also unspecified future, and tells the tale of aliens suddenly and unexpectedly invading Earth on a mass scale. They waste no time on highs and thank yous and arrive in their huge as super powerful ships, guns blazing, killing and destroying anyone and anything that they come across. They never gave us a reason, they just came and began their extraterrestrial planet cleansing. So, in a near immediate response, the XCOM organization was funded, loaded with as much money as the fighting for their survivor countries could offer and charged with repelling of the invaders. Or, if that fails, at least protecting the population as best as they can. And ladies and gentlemen, I see UFO Enemy Unknown as a fantastic single or double season Netflix miniseries. I'd call it XCOM though, as it's simpler, shorter and more catchy. Why double season, you may wonder? Well, I'd have the first season be made out of 6 to 10 episodes and closely follow the first game. It would start off with the initial attack, then focus on one of the teams of XCOM soldiers and a set of few important non-combat staff members. So we would depict our initial struggles as we are facing against considerably more advanced and yet unknown to us aliens. Then, as we manage to recover bits and pieces of their deck, parts of their crafts, command consoles and even weapons, we would start reverse engineering them and slowly but steadily incorporating them into our arsenal and gear. The scientists would naturally study the bodies and recover tech and find themselves being stopped by unforeseen problems a couple of times throughout the show's run, but then they would somehow find an ingenious way to overcome them. Or maybe, perhaps our squad's mission against a particularly nasty alien would bring an unexpected solution in a form of recovered bit of a new tech or intel. Naturally, there would be personal drama in the series too, and I can't imagine not losing one of the core members of the main squad somewhere mid-first season. All in all, the season would end with us miraculously winning the fight for Earth by taking it directly to the alien homeworld, no less. And that is where we would lose another important team member. You know, for the drama effect before the second season. The last episode of the first would end up a couple or so years later with our team's remaining few members back on Earth, now in senior positions, training very few rookies in a at the peaceful times seriously underfunded XCOM base. The quiet idol is then now unexpectedly cut with a loud and deafening alarm, indicating an alien vessel detection. And that ship would come straight from the depths of the ocean. Now tell me, wouldn't you like to watch a sci-fi series like that? I'm sure that the footage makes what I'm about to say more than obvious, as unknowingly you two, I believe, were always hoping for all three Mass Effect games to be made into small 10-12 to 12 episode series with a gigantic budget. You know, to give the source material justice. Followed series treatment to another cult classic. Now this would be an enormous achievement if it was ever made, especially that the game's story is so vast and takes place in space and on many different planets among many different races. Our protagonist to follow would naturally be SSV Normandy's Commander Shepard, the first human spectre, an intergalactic agent serving the so-called Council comprised of the most notable races in the universe. Council that resides in the Citadel, a huge space station and a government heart of the known galaxy. Since in the game you could pick gender for Shepard, so for the series we'd have to decide on it too, most likely based on the actors we'd be screening for the role. For female Shepard, I'd love Rebecca Ferguson to be given a chance to shine as her acting range is phenomenal and she's proven herself in a different sci-fi series already. For a male pick, I think I'd like to see James McAvoy. I know, I know he doesn't look very heroic perhaps, but same as Rebecca, you can tell the man to play a chair or a shark and he played a damn chair or a shark like a boss. Casting aside, the story would naturally start off with Shepard seeking Saren, a rogue acceptor, just to learn along the way of the emergence of a single Reaper named Sovereign, an artificial being of omnipowerful race that comes back to the galaxy every 50,000 years to cleanse it from all higher life forms, leaving only the younger and less advanced species alive. 
This will naturally lead to a clash between all of the Galaxy's races, Sovereign and allied with him Saren too, using the Citadel itself as a weapon to stop them. The story will then follow an accidental death of Commander Shepard, no doubt in a set of heroic and explosive scenes, ending one of the episodes on a blood pressure raising cliffhanger, just to then pick up with him being resurrected by the mysterious elusive man who leads the Cerberus, an organization known for its T-E-R-R-O-R-I-S-T tendencies. While our hero will not be happy about it, he will have to find a way to work with Cerberus to stop once more emerging Reapers, this time using a race of aggressive insectoids, so-called collectors, as their proxies. The eventual success will naturally allow Shepard to part with Cerberus. Soon after, however, the Earth is attacked by the Reapers and Shepard leaves to find the elusive man once again, as seemingly he has the schematics for a weapon powerful enough to stop the Reapers. It's a mission where time is of utmost importance, as the Reapers in large numbers are near unstoppable and even the United Galactic Forces are no match for them. Especially that they all barely defeated just the one a little while before and that they're not as united anymore. In Cerberus, Shepard learns that the elusive men planned to control the Reapers instead of having them destroyed. So after recovering the plans for the device known as Crucible, before it is built, Shepard must recruit other races to help humans survive until it can be constructed and used to save the planet. The third game ended with a selection of three outcomes, all of them sucked to be honest, especially as the culmination to a game series in which you've invested a couple hundred hours. But I see each and every one of them working pretty well in a TV series. I mean, sure, we could have come up with a different one, but I'm just saying that this would be fine too. It has to be kept in mind that while crafting a series made out of Mass Effect, a lot has to be taken under consideration. For one, it's basically a Lord of the Rings kind of a story, so Shepard has got to form a team of unique allies and along the way all of their backgrounds and stories need to be clearly presented to the viewer, just to then have some of them killed off as a result of tragic incidents or morally difficult choices. For two, Shepard's supposed to be a person that's clearly not one born to be a leader or a hero, but one that raced to the occasion when it was necessary and never failed. And finally, viewers' emotions should be taken on a roller coaster of pain, doubt, hope, happiness and suffering in each and every episode. It is a story of desperation and how out of it hope and unity can emerge. What do you guys think? Would you watch Mass Effect if it released that way? Point-and-click adventure games are a genre that seems to be custom-made to be the easiest to transform into a movie. They are mostly linear experiences, relying heavily on their plot and usually following a singular protagonist who's either on a mission, has a problem to solve or the world to save. Sometimes a combination of all three. In The Secret of the Monkey Island's case, however, the movie plot would call for something else. Something entirely different, a fulfillment of one's destiny. Because you see, our hero guy Bruce Freepwood wants to be a pirate. Nay, he needs to become a real pirate. But while he romanticizes what it means to be one, only seeing the good in it, as in sailing the seas, seeking treasures and the likes, he's unaware that most pirates are in fact bad people. And he's anything but bad. So he seeks audience with the three pirate leaders in a local ports bar, scum bar no less, who tell him that to become one, he'll need to complete three trials. The trial of sword mastery, the trial of treasure huntery, and of course, the trial of fevery. And I see the movie starting off in this first act with our clean-shaven, clean-clothed and well-behaved, lovable, gold-hearted goof stumbling into one of the dirtiest, most rundown and barely standing port bars of run by the low lives galore. From your everyday peg-legged and eye-patch-wearing run-of-the-mill pirates, through local thieves and hired killers, to the hardened and constantly pissed at something swashbuckling buccaneers. And his white puffy shirt's contrast with the surrounding dark, dirty and gritty coloring would be near blinding. And despite him being in the most dangerous and alien to him world, he would never, not for a second even, feel out of place. He'll be like a small, nay, tiny fish among great sharks, swimming and acting as if he was the biggest of them all. A king of sharks to be. The next three naturally action-packed comedic acts would see oblivious to the reality surrounding Guybrush take on the trials and fall in love with beautiful Mele Island's governor, Elaine, in the process. So, he'll seek out the Swordmaster and challenge him in an unexpected insults-based combat, he'll have to find the big X, clearly stating where the treasure is buried, just to learn a moment later how disappointing said treasure is. And finally, he'll need to steal a rather junky and disappointing idol from the governor's mansion, damaging large parts of the building beyond repair no less. This fourth act will end with Guybrush learning of the governor's kidnapping by the ghost pirate Lechak, which will redirect the blood in his body from other places Governor Elaine unknowingly moved all of it to, back to his brain. 
And in the last act, he will have to somehow acquire the ship and crew and sail off to save the love of his life. And as he does all that, he unknowingly actually becomes a pirate. A good one perhaps, but a pirate no less. I imagine the secret of the Monkey Island movie to be a mix between Pirates of the Caribbean and Mr. Bean's kids. So wild, fast, fun and most importantly, portraying the least plausible person becoming something great and doing so with an unexpected ease. And all that because he didn't realize that it was theoretically impossible for him to do so. Both of the Half-Life games are among the most beloved titles of many gamers. And deservedly so, as they did not only represent their FPS genre like a boss, but also innovated in terms of tech, level design and most importantly, immersive storytelling. Both hold a solid and unchanged in years 8.7 score on Moby Games website, so much higher than 99% of all other games. The first game takes place in a top secret and well hidden Black Mesa research facility that's performing extremely dangerous and morally questionable experiments under a government contract. And the story follows Gordon Freeman, a scientist and Black Mesa employee. During one of the seemingly routine anti-mass spectrometer experiments, something goes horribly wrong. I mean, nothing about anti-mass whatever it's called sounds even remotely routine to me, but you know, I know not what I'm saying, I'm not a genius scientist. A doctor of all sciences, real and imaginary perhaps, but nothing more. Anyway, as it turns out, the failed experiment allowed beings from Dimension Zen to cross to ours, so they did, and injured or killed many of the Black Mesa employees. In a response to that, a marine team is sent to the facility to kill all the invaders and Black Mesa employees alike, as such a potentially catastrophic failure cannot be made public. So from that point onward, Gordon realizes that to survive and escape, he will have to fight with both, aliens and marines. In the end, somehow and against all odds, he manages to defeat all the deadliest alien monstrosities, shoot his way through the marines and even close the portal leading to Earth. But as he'd done all that, he was captured, disarmed and overpowered by the interdimensional agent of sorts going by the very erotic name of G-Man. G-Man tells Gordon that his employers would like to hire him for a special assignment. Upon agreeing given that the alternative was death, Gordon is put into stasis from which he reawakens in the opening act of the second game 20 years later. The future Earth is different. It was subjugated by the alien race known as the Combine that uses former Black Mesa higher-ups as a powerless puppet to lead the world in their name. Reawakened from his prolonged slumber after a few tumultuous events, Gordon joins the rebellion with the aim of freeing Earth from the alien rule. So, through many twists and turns that his adventure takes him on, he eventually ends up in the Citadel, the HQ of the alien operations on Earth, led by Dr. Breen, ex-Black Mesa executive and now a puppet ruler of the planet. Gordon manages to defeat him, which results in the time temporarily being frozen by the G-Men that reappeared once more and praised Gordon for his impressive achievement. Now, while Half-Life 2 received two expansions, I feel that we don't need to get into them here for the purpose of the potential movie. Because unlike all the other games we've spoken about today, I wouldn't like the movie or the TV series to follow either of the games. Weird, right? Well, if you think about it, I believe that it's what you want too. Perhaps not yet, but as soon as I explain. I would love the live-action release to become Half-Life 3, to follow up on the story that we know from the games and not come back to what we replayed by many of us countless times. I'd like it to pick up directly after the second game ended and expand upon its plot, leading to a satisfying conclusion of this already over 20 years in the making tale. I understand that some of you may want to point out that starting so late in the story may mean that many people will feel alienated and find it difficult to follow. But in reality, many if not most sci-fi series and movies always start in a particular point in time and it's usually made some kind of a conflict or turbulent times. So, starting in the middle of it all is not bad, as long as it's done in a smart and well laid out logically way. And also, with use of retrospective flashbacks, most if not all gaps that remain could be filled. So, tell me, would you like to finally get that Half-Life 3 that we've all given up on a long time ago already? I know I would. I loved Goonies as a kid. I mean, the first time that I saw it was some years after it originally came out, but its impact on me was unquestionable nonetheless. It was a fun, adventurous and full of weirdness, twists and turns story that told the tale of a group of kids unexpectedly saving their hometown, helping in apprehending of the criminal family of Fratellis and growing as persons along the way. Each of the main characters were unique, they had their own motivations, things that they were good at, weaknesses that they had to conquer along their adventure, hopes and dreams. And I imagine Maniac Mansion to become something very similar but leaning a lot towards the B-movie horror genre. 
The story, same as the game, would follow Dave Miller and his friends trying to save Dave's girlfriend Sandy from the mad scientist Dr. Fred Edison. Yes, of those Edisons, I think. Anyway, he abducted her against her will and keeps her in his haunted-looking rundown mansion. In the game you could choose which two of six friends of Dave would join him and help him mount a daring rescue. And depending on who you've picked, some quests would have different solutions. For the movie, we could settle on only two friends of Dave too. Or let our imaginations run wild and include all of them. That said, whichever way we go, and regardless how many of them we pick, Bernard Bernoulli would have to be among them. He was one of the most iconic choices in the game, sporting huge as thick framed black glasses and being a living and breathing definition of a nerd coward. He is also a main protagonist of the second game, so for a potential movie follow-up to make sense, he should be included in the first. Since unlike most other adventure games Maniac Mansion was set in a single huge location, as it was contained to the titular mansion, the gameplay was largely non-linear. So a movie based on it could also allow itself for quite a few freedoms. Especially in the order of the scenes to set them up in a way that would make them the most fun. Now, if you've played the game, you know that there are a lot of puzzles or situations in it which when approached improperly or at the wrong time could result in your characters being caught or in trouble. Same could happen in the movie. I see our hero and his friends many times barely escaping capture, numerous near-death experiences and their hopefully hilariously funny clashes with the two sentient tentacles and Dr. Fred's weird-ass family. But I also imagine them coming up with intricate plans to distract the Edisons, have them run around the mansion looking for our heroes, while they'll be working to save Sandy's ass. It would be cool if, same as in the Goonies and the game, each of the main characters would have to use their unique skills and know-hows to help their mission to succeed. I imagine Maniac Mansion to be this kind of a reverse escape room type of a scenario, where instead of kids trying to escape the captivity, they are seeking clues and solving puzzles to find their way in and to rescue Dave's girlfriend while avoiding being captured themselves. It could be a fun summer flick for teens and kids of all ages. Even kids at my age. There are obviously many more games that would be fun as movies or TV series and we may talk about them in the future videos. But for now, I'd like to know what you think of these five. Do any of them sound like something you'd like to watch? Or maybe you would, but made in a different way than I imagined? Or perhaps there are other games that would be fun to see in a live-action format? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. And maybe share it too, it helps more than you know. If you didn't, then don't naturally. It was fun talking to you as usual, and I'll see you, or more accurately, talk to you very soon.